you guys aren't going to believe it. After I recorded all my lessons on waves, uh, superposition of waves, these set of slides, stationary waves, and radioactivity, when I went back to look at the stationary waves footage, all the audio was messed up. It made me want to pull my hair out! And now i got to re-record this lesson. So here we go. The learning outcomes associated with stationary waves are to demonstrate and explain the formation of stationary waves, to identify nodes and antinodes on a stationary wave, and determine the wavelength of sound waves using stationary waves. A stationary wave is produced when two progressive waves of the same frequency traveling in opposite directions combine. So you see why superposition is uh, sort of a necessary prerequisite to thinking about stationary waves. We need that coherence so that they're of the same frequency so that we can kind of ensure um, there's, there's going to continuously be that, that interference when we apply superposition. So the nodes are the places on the stationary wave with no displacement. Node, node displacement, right? Kind of works. And then the antinodes are those places of maximum displacement where there's a lot of motion in the medium that the stationary wave uh, sort of exists on. Stationary waves can exist in different types of media. So here's kind of what a, a stationary waveform would look like if the red wave up here is a progressive wave that were sent out and it's reflected at, say, this point right here. It's going to come back as this blue wave and that interference pattern that we observe between um, the outgoing wave and the return wave is a stationary wave. Uh, the points here are the antinodes, you know, as uh, labeled down here, and then all of the black points on the waveform are the nodes. There's another waveform here, and I think you're just seeing sort of like the different amplitudes that the stationary wave may have. And so we kind of think about the, you know, the, the more that the medium is, is oscillating, that's related to the energy that's stored within the wave. But we do want to make a distinction between the progressive waves that transfer energy and then stationary waves, which do not transfer energy. Um, you know, all of the energy is contained within the wave. So usually we get a standing wave when we reflect a wave at a boundary and it interferes with itself. And that's kind of explained on this slide here. Identify nodes and antinodes on a stationary wave. And so the key signature of a standing wave is this repeating pattern of nodes and antinodes. Uh, we can see or hear this pattern with standing waves and strings or in sound waves respectively. We must detect this pattern with a microwave detector if creating a standing wave using microwaves because our eyes don't see in microwave. Uh, we see visible light. I want to get a standing wave of visible light. That's something to think about. <clears throat> Just in different types of wave, waves on a string, sound waves, microwaves, and others. Uh, so the, the slides I'm looking at now were from uh, a week when we were going to manually try to create a stationary wave using the wave on a string simulation. Uh, I'll probably make a, a subsequent video you know, doing that. And then I included this link here uh, to try to you know, amp up the, the students for the lab. And so I'll leave it to you to, to kind of follow that up uh, if you'd like to. It's a good way to get you in, in the mood for you know, a manual uh, standing wave lab. It says, like when Captain Picard asked Commander Riker to dock the saucer section of the Enterprise manually. Remember that? Clips right there. That's how it's done, Matt Damon. <laughs> Referring to Interstellar, of course, not the Martian. Make sure you have a fixed end. This will be a node, right? So if you go in here and do this, you know, you want one end to be fixed. As we talked about earlier, the wave goes out, it hits that boundary, it comes back and is reflected, and we get that characteristic pattern. So you're looking for those places of no displacement and those places of maximum displacement in the antinodes. Meld's apparatus is uh, sort of a typical way to create a stationary wave on a string in the laboratory. I think Meld himself was the one who coined the term stationary wave. That's a very researchable question that one of you students, you know, could have done for your fourth nine weeks project. It's not too late, depending on when you're watching this video. We can see that there's going to be a node where the pulley is because the string can't move there. There's tension in the, uh, the string from the mass that's being suspended from it. And so 
the string is, isn't free to move here. It sort of forces it into a node. And so by varying the distance that the apparatus, you know, sort of where the string is being oscillated by sort of like an, an electric motor that's oscillating the string, depending on the length of that string and the frequency of the oscillation, the tension in the string, uh, you can create standing waves of, of various frequencies and sort of observe it in the lab by um, inspection, you know, by seeing the, the places of no displacement, you know, it looks pretty cool. Um, to see that. There's another picture of Meld's apparatus. Mass hanger pulley. And then here in this example, you can see here, here, and as we mentioned, at the pulley itself is a node. So one, two, three, four nodes, one, two, three anti nodes. In the guitar, strings are pinned at endpoints, ensuring nodes. Because the string has a fixed length, there are only certain frequencies that will work to give us a stationary wave. And those frequencies are called the harmonics. And so the, the simplest one we see here, the first harmonic. So if you have a length of string L, and the first harmonic is just sort of plucking the string, and the string goes, you know, like this, just sort of up and down. That's the first harmonic. And so the oscillation, the waveform kind of looks like that. And that's only half of a wavelength. So if you look at from sort of endpoint to endpoint, we're looking at half of a waveform. We can see in the second harmonic from endpoint going back through uh, sort of equilibrium and then back up here, that's one entire wavelength. So for the first harmonic, the wave itself um, is twice the length of the string, right? Because there's only half of a wavelength on the string. So they say, you know, if your algebra, if the length is, half, if we can see half of a wavelength on this length L, then we do some algebra and the wavelength must be 2L. So we can calculate the wavelength, you know, of that standing wave in the guitar string. The second harmonic uh, where we have one waveform. And so L is two over two lambda. And so the wavelength is just equal to the length of the string. For the third harmonic, and so that, that sort of would be like we're pinned at both ends and the, the, the uh, standing wave is kind of going like that, where there's also a node in the middle, right? And so the, the anti-nodes are sort of oscillating on either side. Another really important key idea to be mindful of for stationary waves is that when you're looking at a stationary wave and we can kind of see uh, that it, it looks like a series of loops, like the third harmonic there, like three loops where the, the nodes sort of exist between them. It's important to note that adjacent uh, loops on a stationary wave are always oscillating antiphase, completely out of phase with each other. So 180 degrees out of phase. So like while this part of the wave is down here in the second harmonic, after the node, we would have you know this part of the wave over here. And so all those particles are moving so that there's there's a moment in time when the, the stationary wave just looks like this. Everything is at equilibrium. Of course, there's still energy in the wave, and so they continue to sort of move like this. And so they're moving in antiphase. Adjacent nodes oscillate 180 degrees out of phase or in antiphase, we say, with each other, which means if we go to the, the next loop over, then they'll also be in phase. And so there are, there are many physics questions uh, that belong to sort of that concept, questions like, you know, pointing out two, two points on a waveform and saying, what is the phase difference between these points? And if, they've, if you already know it's a stationary wave, then those points are either completely in phase or they're completely out of phase. Because of the, the nature of a stationary wave, all the points on the waveform are either moving sort of together, like they're all moving up if they're, you know, sort of uh, not the next door neighbor, but the, the next neighbor over, right? Those are all moving up. So in the third harmonic, this loop right here, let's say above the, the black line, would be all those particles moving up at the same time all of these particles over here were, while the adjacent uh, loop would be here. So remember that the particles can only sort of exist in, in, in one point in time. What we're seeing is the pattern of that constant motion between them. And so at different moments in time, these particles are going to oscillate like this. And so we're just sort of visualizing what that stationary waveform kind of looks like. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing more than one snapshot of time. Sometimes you'll see a figure like this with a dashed line coming back to sort of reemphasize that idea. Here we also see um, another uh, slide on a guitar string. And so it's important to be mindful of just sort of what, what is physically true here. Well, in a guitar string, we are fixed at both ends. And so that ensures nodes. And so an antinode in, in between, that's the first sort of, that's, that's the first possible waveform that can exist. Um, 
because we're pinned down. We can't have a wave that's a little bit longer than that because then it wouldn't be pinned down. It would be moving where, where it just can't be. So we have to sort of think about in physics, what is physically possible? And then you see the second harmonic, the third harmonic, and this one goes all the way up to the fourth harmonic there. So you can see node, two nodes, three, four, five nodes, and one, two, three, four antinodes. So this loop here would be moving pop quiz. What is the phase difference between all of the particles moving in this node, oh, I'm sorry, between this node and this node, and all the particles that are moving between this node and this node? I'll rephrase the question and give you time to think. What is the phase difference between the particles that are all moving in between nodes 1 and 2? and all of the particles that are moving between nodes two and three. Take a moment to think. <clears throat> That's right. They're 180 degrees out of phase, or if you said they're anti-phase, because they're adjacent loops, right? And so we know that they're gonna be, you know, all these particles are moving up, all these ones are moving down. Good job. Uh, this, this slide really contains the same information that we've, we've just previously covered. And it's just designed to really reinforce the idea. So as you're going through the slides, you kind of see that. Oh, it seems like the same thing, and that's exactly what it is. It's just sort of a slightly different figure. Here we do kind of see that they have this in dark blue and this one in light blue. And, and that is designed to sort of emphasize the fact that all of these points, uh, you know, all of the particles, say, of this string can only exist at one place in time, so they can't both be sort of here and here, but just a moment later, all the particles that are sort of above the, the plane of that black line are going to be below it, so they're, they're kind of moving like, do I need to do that? Kind of like that, right? So that's a, that's a hand stationary wave with a node right there where my <laughs> Determining the wavelength of sound waves using stationary waves is a learning objective, and there are various apparatus uh, sort of that we can utilize to do that. One is this dust tube where they might be sending like a, a wave through this metal. And so we're really trying to measure maybe the speed of sound through that metal, and so we let the sound propagate through the metal. And then as it sort of uh, reverberates this, this disc here, it's going to create a pressure wave, a sound wave inside of this tube. And if you put, you know, bits of dust or powder inside of that, uh, by adjusting the length of that piston, you can ju just sort of by trial and error almost uh, wait until you get a stationary wave. And so the sound wave, depending on the frequency of the sound wave or, or the velocity with which it's traveling in air there, it's going to move out. It's going to hit that boundary, right? And you can either have an open or a closed end here. Um, to either have a, a, a node or an anti-node at that end. If it's closed, it's going to be a node because the air can't move past the, the closed end there. And so as the wave hits that, the reflected sound wave comes back, and, depend, and if we get the length right, we can create a stationary wave. The observable evidence of that is going to be the existence of these piles of, of powder, and that's where the, the, the pressure wave that's sort of moving through that column of air um, it's not moving at all, so it's a it's a node, a place of no displacement, and so that's why it, it's sort of like where the antinode is. Remember what what the sound wave actually is? It's it's air particles that are moving longitudinally. So the air particles are moving left and right as that wave is also moving left and right, and so that the air particles are sort of clearing out all of these places right here uh, in between the piles of um, powder in this case, or you know, sometimes called a dust tube. They're clearing out all that dust, and so therefore the, the dust is going to clump up or pile up on the places where there's nodes. So you could count out the, the piles of you know uh, powder or, or dust, and that would be the number of nodes. Then you could do a calculation. If we think back to the waveforms that we've been previously looking at, by knowing how many nodes and antinodes, you could sort of sketch a waveform like this and do this sort of a calculation um, to deduce the wavelength. We know that between two nodes, there is half of a wavelength, for example. So if we just measure the distance between two nodes, and we know, well, that's half uh, of, of a wavelength, then we can, you know, double it. 
dig it. This is another slide that kind of shows that. This one again is like sound waves moving through this metal and then trying to measure maybe the speed of uh, sound through the metal. Here we just have a frequency generator hooked up to a speaker. And so this, you know, would be sound of a constant frequency. It's going to hit the side here and come back. And you can kind of see where the dust has piled up there. One, two, three, four nodes where the dust is clumped up. In a resonance tube, a node exists at the water-air boundary because the air cannot readily oscillate into the water, and an antinode exists at the open end of the column. So you have this sort of a setup here. Um, they have next to it this, this analogy of a vibrating string where we, we must have a node right here. Um, there must be an antinode at the open end there. And then it says, only certain wavelengths will work to achieve this for an air column of a given length. Um, in order to get that standing wave, right? We've been discussing how only, there are only certain allowable frequencies based on the length of the string, um, the height of the air column, etc. This could be varied by changing the water level. So you could make more or less water in there and you can see you can fit in sort of more uh, of the wave by increasing the amount of air re relative to the amount of water. And so the first resonance it says here is gonna be just a quarter of a wavelength. Um, take a look at the, the example, uh, the work example problem I did, I think involving a, um, a trumpet or, or a horn where, where we, musical instruments, as we've seen with the guitar example, make use of stationary waves. So like wind instruments um, make use of a, a stationary wave in an air column. String instruments, a stationary wave on a string and so on. So here we can see that there is a quarter of a waveform at the first resonance. You have a node and then it opens up to an antinode. Well, that's only one quarter of a waveform. The next resonance is going to be at a node at the bottom here. There's another node, but it has to end at an antinode. Remember, with an open um, tube, we're going to have an antinode there because the, the air is free to, to move a lot. And so we're trying to get that water level just right to where we could observe that there would be an antinode. Well, how do we do that? This would be with a tuning fork right here. So the tuning fork is going to resonate with the frequency of the stationary wave. And so by holding the tuning fork sort of above the uh, resonance tube there, and by adjusting the water level, you know, you, you click the, the tuning fork and it sends the sound wave in. And when it comes back up, it's going to reverberate if you've created that stationary wave, if you've got the water level right. That will only happen at these specific uh, wavelengths. You know, when there's a quarter of a waveform, when there's three-fourths of a wavelength, when there's five-fourths of a wavelength, and you might have noticed a pattern there. One-fourth, three-fourths, five-fourths, seven-fourths, and so on would be all the next resonances or harmonics. Uh, here's a link to a nice video that kind of shows that. This slide is to emphasize when we have a closed end and an open end, what part of the stationary wave sort of exists there. So at the close end, there's a node, and you can just kind of think about that with common sense. Well, the, the particles can't really move freely through a closed end. They have to be able to move freely at, at an open end. That's where we're going to have um, an antinode. And so that makes the mathematics a little bit different because you have different possible waveforms that can exist. If you sort of reflected this image on the top there, sort of a mirror image uh, about the vertical axis, you would get a waveform like this. But if that's the same length there, L, then what you're really doing is like you're, you're increasing the frequency, you're, you're squashing the wave, you're fitting more wave in the same length. And so now we've got half of a wavelength, right? Going like from the, let's say a crest up here through equilibrium and then down to this trough. Well, from crest down to trough is half of a wavelength. So we have, an open tube that's open on both ends, then the sort of first allowable uh, frequency is going to be when you have half of a wavelength, an antinode at both ends. As we've seen with a closed pipe, you will have a quarter of a wavelength as that first allowable frequency. Note how different wavelengths can exist as standing waves depending on if the tube is closed or open. And so this kind of just goes through all of those harmonics with closed waves on the left and open waves, um, <laughs> open tubes on the right. Closed tubes on the left, open tubes on the right, and those are all the different, the, the first couple of uh, possible wavelengths that can exist. And you can see the pattern there and extrapolate if you'd like. Note here the use of the convention to have the dashed line, sort of emphasizing that these 
particles, you know, exist in these spaces at different times. <clears throat> Standing waves in a flute. So if all of these are closed and the first uh, hole that's open is this one down here, then you have a pretty long waveform to get to that harmonic. But if this is the first uh, hole that's open, then it's going to be a shorter wavelength, so a higher note. And so again, how we can um, design musical instruments making use of the physics of stationary waves. The clarinet, I think this includes a sample problem uh, that I'll leave to you to try on your own. Leave it down in the comments what you get and I'll check that and see if you're correct. Microwaves, uh, we can create a standing wave as we said with different types of wave including microwaves. So if we emit a microwave out in one direction it hits a boundary, it can come back and interfere with itself just like with all the other types of waves we've talked about. We would need this microwave detector though to, to see, well, where did the intensity sort of go very low, those places at the node, and where did it go very high? So by detecting this pattern of the signal goes really low, then it gets really high, then it gets really low, then really high, we're detecting anti-node, node, anti-node, anti -node, node, and so on. So we know that we've got the length right to get our uh, standing microwave. With a microwave, we know it's light, so it always moves at the same velocity. <clears throat> but we have to be able to detect the, uh, you know, we can't see those microwaves even though it's light. There's some links here. This is, I think, a pretty cool uh, link to a, a Veritasium video about um, plasma grapes and microwaves. Pretty cool. Electrons are standing waves? Yes, electrons are pinned down in three-dimensional space around the nucleus, and the standing wave patterns are the familiar electron orbitals you studied in chemistry. Having only certain allowable frequencies underpins the branch of physics known as quantum mechanics. And so here you see kind of some of these orbitals that you study there, and it's, it's really um, thinking about an electron as a wave, this idea of wave-particle duality, that, you know, light can be thought of as photons, particles. You know, we, we've been talking about the... the uh, wave-like properties of light also in these in these lessons. So there's this wave-particle duality and electrons might be thought of as particles but they could also be thought of as waves and their standing waves pin down sort of around the nucleus um, in three-dimensional space giving you know these sort of uh, complicated sort of 3D patterns that you kind of see here. So this is just the, the simplest one. This is just I think one electron and sort of the different states that it could be in. Uh, based on the hydrogen wave function that if you have really, really good eyesight, you might be able to read that, but if you're interested enough, go ahead and search that on your own. And then my favorite equation in all of physics, the de Broglie wavelength, which just basically, it gets back to this idea of wave-particle duality, and even things that, that we kind of might think of as particulate, you know, particles of matter are really waves, and just the wavelength might be just too small for us to, you know, measure. One, one way to think about it, it's a little more complicated than that, uh, but the equation says that the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant h, which is a really, really tiny number divided by the momentum. We know momentum is mass times velocity. Um, there's really cool physics about um, so making use of the de Broglie wavelength and kinetic molecular theory, so when things are, are moving very slowly, they're very cold, so we get ultra-cold atoms, we can actually start to observe those, like, gas particles. We always think of gas like particles crashing around. We get them super cold, we're making the velocity of those particles really low, and they actually start to get noticeable wavelengths. That's actually uh, something that an Indian physicist, Satyendra Bose, discovered back in 1923, and in correspondence with Einstein, developed a branch of mathematics known as Bose-Einstein statistics, and they predicted the state of matter, um, Bose-Einstein condensation, that was actually created in a laboratory um, in 1995 by uh, Eric Cornell, Carl Wyman at the uh, University of Colorado Boulder, and... Um, Wolfgang Ketterle up at MIT. I think they shared in the Nobel Prize in 2001 for creating the first Bose-Einstein condensates um, with rubidium and sodium atoms. And so that, that sort of uh, the alkali metals. Anyway, the de Broglie wavelength. Really, really cool physics there. All right, so wave goodbye. Next is radioactivity. Hopefully I don't have to re-record these slides again. I'm going to make air left.